Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is time for Hour 2 of Guy Talk. Thank you for all the great questions that have come in, and we are going to tackle everyone that we can. 877-933-2484. I've got a professor, a pastor, and a scientist here around the studio. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Brian D. Brian, you were here last week, but uh, remind everyone, let everyone know who you are and what you do. So officially, my current position is... Uh, considered a pastor to people that would never darken the doorway of a church. And I picked that up about five years with search ministries. Prior to that, I was with a defense contractor, Lockheed Martin, for about 15 years. Uh, And I was managing laboratories and uh, test and measurement processes uh, for the industry. Um, Before that, other various um, tech endeavors, um, but some of it lab science and the like. So... Yeah, it's been a fun transition to get into this. Oh, awesome. And Tom, how many years have you pastored? Um, 48 years. Long 48 time. years? Yeah. You've been at it a while. Yeah, so taught high school for two years, then went to seminary, and then began pastoring. Nice. And Greg, how long have you been professorializing? <laughs> professorializing, it started. Is that a good word? I just sure. made that up. Yeah. Well, Depends on what you mean by it, but if it actually I don't know what formally, I mean by it. But, but you actually, formally, it probably started in 1991 when I started teaching, and I've been doing it ever since. I'm an adjunct professor now at the University of Northwestern. All right. In the previous hour, you brought up the term threshold thinking, mm-hmm. yeah. and Andrew wanted to know, what is threshold thinking? Well, let me just recount a story which demonstrates what I mean by it. It was actually originally told by Neil T. Anderson in his book, Victory Over Darkness, and it's about Kathy, this doty secretary, appeared in a comic strip who had a weakness for candy. She says to herself, I'm going to get in my car, but I'm not going to drive down the road that the store is that has my candy. Then she drives down the road and she says, I'm not going to go in the store where my candy is. Then she goes into the store and I'm not going to go down the aisle where my candy is. Then she walks down the aisle. I'm not going to pick up the bag. And then the last frame is munch, 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 munch. When should she, Kathy, have stopped it? not getting in the car. That's threshold thinking. The idea that sin begins to play with you if you play with it. If you're entertaining the temptation for any given length of time, it will ultimately consume you because you cross over the threshold almost to the point of no return. So you have to stop it right at the threshold as soon as you receive that temptation. And you have this promise from Scripture. There is no temptation overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful and just and will give you a way to endure it so that you're able to endure it. So stop it right at the threshold. That's what we mean. Good illustration. I've kind of heard a similar description. Um, The best way to not commit sin is don't be there when it happens. <laughs> I, like I like that. that. That's it's great. Good. Don't be there when it happens. That's good. I like that. I also have encouraged men that are in recovery. I said, as you're putting your shoes on, pray for your feet because where your feet are is where the rest of your body will be. Good oh, point. that's a good point yeah, that's too. Good. That's great. Nice. Because you know, they often talk about relapsing and I go, how'd you relapse? Well, I was in my cousin's basement and that's where we used to use... I go, well, how'd you end up in your cousin's basement? That temptation's too great. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Your feet brought you there. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're here we need Jeff V, probably, uh, because this question is about Revelation chapter 10. And do we know what the little scroll said? Why John was told not to write it down and why he was told to eat the scroll? All right, Jeff, if you're listening, call in. <laughs> <laughs> That was Revelation 10? Revelation 10, yeah. It's the angel and the little scroll. So this is, um, I have not studied this particular passage, so I am i don't know. I wouldn't know how no, to get the conversation started. No, I'd have to dig into it myself. Yeah. All right, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Uh, talks about God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All right? Um, that is true, but also in Matthew, Jesus talks about that most will go to eternal punishment. How do we balance these two out? Well, one is talking about the Lord's will. The other one is talking about human behavior. Exactly. The Lord's will here is that he wants everybody saved. He's not, it's not like he says, Bill, you're getting in, but Greg, you're not. He loves us all. But human nature is that we oftentimes want to go down the broad path where everybody else is going and we ignore him. And as a result, if we do that to the very last moment and don't cry out to Jesus, then we have gone the wrong way. And he is, I I heard one pastor say it this way, the Lord Jesus grieves when people refuse him. That's how much he loves us. It's an incredible statement. I, I really think this is where we get into the free will question. And you, you, you get a clear picture of what God wants. What he wants is for all to be saved. That's what he really wants. Mm-hmm. And yet we know that not all are saved. So does it mean that God's not all powerful? No, it means that God has given us the free will choice. Just like uh, in any kind of relationship choice, it's not a loving relationship that can result unless it was done out of free will. So you don't see, um, well, maybe you do see shotgun weddings, but um, you don't see a really um, uh, any better demonstration of free will and love than when somebody freely chose to marry the other. Now, I don't understand why my wife chose to marry me, but it has a whole lot more meaning that she did choose me over someone else. And here we've got this demonstration of God wanting us to choose him, but not making us choose him. It's tragic that people will not choose him, but we get a clear glimpse of God's heart here, and he wants all to be saved. I told my eighth grade students today, I challenged them. I said, I want to know if you are willing to covenant with me to read one chapter a day starting Monday till the end of December, If you read John and then followed by Romans, that would be 37 chapters. Are you willing to do that? I said, I'm not going to grade you on it. I'm going to give you a form to check it off, give you an opportunity to respond what God may be saying to you. Who is willing to do that? Well, all of them raised their hand, but some of them are probably not going to do it. I think that it's the best for them, and they're going to learn so much if they did it, exposing themselves to the Word, But I can't force them to do it, because if I force them to do it, it wouldn't mean anything to them, and they might resent it. So that's on a a, small scale, what we're talking about is this thing about, you know, this is the best for you if you only knew. And I think that's what God says to us. This is the best for you if you only knew, if you'll just receive me. And there are going to be some people who are going to turn their back. So he wants all to be saved but he knows some are going to refuse him. All right, 877-933-2484. Gentlemen, how would you counsel someone that said, I have a lot of regrets in life, and I just, I'm stuck? I would say to him that, or her. are you talking about, or her, are they a Christian? Are you assuming they're a Christian? They are Christian. They are Christian. When you receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, He died for your sins, past, present, and future. In several places in Scripture, he says he blots them out. He puts them behind him. They've been paid for. So if you're constantly being reminded of the sins of your past, in this case they're describing it as regrets, that's not of the Lord. It may come in a first-person language in your brain that you're regretting these things, but The enemy always wants to bring you to the failures of your past. God wants to bring you to the victory of your future, and your struggle is in the present. But God is God, and Satan is not. Imagine it moves from a regret to a testimony. What if, what if those things of your past are testimony to your past, not to your present or to your future? Your new life in Christ is witness and testimony to the absence of those things. 
those are things that you could get up and say as a testimony rather than as regret, perhaps. I've heard this a lot as a pastor. There's a lot in counseling. You hear this all the time. And uh, everything you're saying is exactly right. That's where I go with people. I talk to people. I ask them, though, an initial question. I'll say, all right, is there, are there any of those regrets that you still have the opportunity to go make right or to repent of in front of somebody? Because usually regrets involve people. I've been amazed at how many people have said, well, it was my mother-in-law or it was my daughter or my son. And I'm thinking, all right, as Christians, we can't be content to just receive Jesus' forgiveness as though that's over and done. It is both and. So you do exactly what you said, Greg. You receive the Lord's forgiveness. You put it to work. And then you look at what can be done. And I have literally gone with people to family members and sat down with them and say, we want to have a three-way talk. Bill has something to say to you that he's been holding a long time. And I've heard people in front of other people repent and say, I mistreated you. I was wrong. I sinned against you and against the Lord. Will you forgive me? Some people get forgiven. Some people don't. But I help people understand that the moment you do that, not only have you done what was right in front of the Lord, you've done what's right in front of the person the Lord would want, and now the burden lies on them. And when you said forgiven, you're talking about the individual they're talking to, not God. Yes, they're talking to the individual, too. Right. It depends on the circumstance that that is, because uh, I've worked with a lot of women that have had abortions, and they live in deep regret over those abortions, and they're, they're bitter and angry at people over that. And they want to be able to go to that baby and say, I'm sorry for what I did. Well, they don't have that opportunity now. I tell them, when you get to heaven, you'll have a chance. But right now, you know, who are you bitter at over this? And I have heard more and more women say to me, I'm bitter at my mother. I'm bitter at my father because they railroaded me into getting this abortion when I didn't really want it, but I was too young. And I said, have you ever gone to them and told them you forgive them or were anything like that? Uh, most, well, I can't think of any in the beginning who told me they did. Uh, but some actually did. And was it hard? Yeah. But I've had women come back and say to me, I have more relief now than I've had in the last 30 years over what I did back then. So I think that one thing we have to do is that sometimes it's just you and the Lord. But I also understand if I've hurt people, I've got to go back and talk to them or they've hurt me. And we've got to find a way to reconcile. Well, sometimes the forgiveness is you need to forgive yourself. Yeah. And God has already forgiven you. And you're holding yourself still accountable. In essence, and I know probably you may not mean it this way, but we crucify Christ all over again when we revisit the regrets that we have and we don't realize that God is taking care of those. And it's true. I mean, some terrible things have happened to people. But you have to learn to forgive yourself because God forgave you. And the enemy doesn't want you to forgive yourself because it means he'll sideline you and you won't be effective and, uh, at all for, for the kingdom. That's his ploy. What a, that's a great uh, comment, demonstrating the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Christ. Sure. Uh, you know, there, that uh, you can't say that it wasn't enough. It will always be enough. That's right. always is. Yeah. The enemy might tell you it's not, but Jesus has told you it is. Yeah, it's interesting. I had... Uh... I've told this story a long time ago. I had a woman come to me, and she talked to me for two hours and said nothing. <laughs> she came back a week later and talked for two hours and said almost nothing. By the third time she came, she actually stopped and started crying, and she cried for the first 15 minutes. And then she looked at me, and she said, you're actually listening to me, aren't you? Well, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. She said, what I'm bitter about is that my uncle molested me as a child. He's now in the hospital dying of cancer. Part of my conviction as a Christian is I should go up and tell him about Jesus, but I'm so bitter at him for what he did. How do I reconcile this? And in her case, she actually went to the hospital, met with him for two days in a row, told him, you know, brought this up, and he repented in front of her. And she prayed with him to receive Jesus, and he literally died in her presence. Wow. You know, these are the kind of things that, that we have opportunities. doesn't work for everybody, but there are moments that that has to happen. And uh, that guy got a, a gift on his deathbed. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a little break and be right back with your question. I hope you send it over. 877-933-2484. I'll say that again. 
eight four. Maybe it's a question you uh, have that you heard at church on Sunday. Maybe it's something from your Bible study or or something that's just been nagging. Send it over. We'll try our best to answer it. 877-933-2484. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner? And like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at myfaithradio.com. We're back with real work. I'm sorry. We got real questions coming in and we want to hear from you. 877-933-2484 and... There's so many, so much authentic questions that come in, and some are really hard to deal with in a short amount of time. Yeah. Some we, we look at and we think, okay, that's a whole hour. And so if your question does not get answered, that doesn't mean we don't think about it and want to answer it. We just have to make sure we give it an adequate amount of time. Mm-hmm. So I want to do a little follow-up quick question to about regrets. And this is a kind of a personal question to you three under no obligation to answer it. But if you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently? And the, the answer can't be invest in Apple stock. <laughs> <laughs> you mean if we have a regret, had a regret? If you knew, if, yeah. If, it, back then, if, if we knew back then what we know now, yes. how would we have yes. responded? Yes, yes. In my case, it would have been totally different because I am totally different than when that happened. Okay. Um, and that regret. And so I would be approaching it differently in terms of forgiveness, which at that point I wasn't ready to do. Gotcha. Yeah. How about you, Tom? First 10 years of my marriage to Jan, we've been married 52 years, was a disaster. I mean, I'm, I'm in seminary, I'm in school. You think it's got to be peaches and roses, right? Now it was anything but. What I regretted was that I had a tendency to read her actions out of my temperament. In other words, if I would, it, like a birthday, you know what I want for my birthday? A party. You know, what did she give me? Candlelight dinner. I interpreted that as if she really loved me, she would have done more than that. She's too lazy. And we went back and forth on one another like that. Her birthday come along, guess what I'd have? A birthday party. And she'd look at it as the introvert and say, He did that for himself. He knows I don't like those kind of things. Why does he do that? I had to learn her temperament and who she was, and my regret was it took 10 years to get there. I'm thankful we got there. Isn't that interesting? Because we tend to give other people what we think we would like. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I I think for me the, the regret I have is I wouldn't have waited so long to, um, to talk to somebody that, um, basically their their actions affected my career hmm. and i i let that go on a, a really long time um i think i would have done something about it sooner i think i would have had the conversation sooner i'm even going back as far as like grade school for me where i think i wished i would have been uh, more transparent and more honest with why do i read a page in a book and not get it Oh, I, speaking I felt, up about difficulty reading. I felt stupid. Yeah. And if I would have verbalized that, someone might have said, well, you might have to read it a second time. Yeah. Because, my, you know, my reading and comprehension was a little foggy. Where I'd read a page and I'd go, I don't know what I just read. And then I would feel stupid. Mm-hmm. And I wished I would have said, hey, I don't know if I'm getting this after one, one reading. And then someone might have said, oh, no, no, you've got to read it two or three times to get it. Mm-hmm. That, so... Good word. I think a lot of people have those kind of things, especially from grade school years. You know, there's there's a lot of impact in that time period about who you are as a personality. And uh, quite frankly, uh, what you're saying is absolutely right. I've seen it over and over in kids. Uh, kids that most people would say in fourth grade are stupid or really can't learn, or maybe they should just go into a trade, which is a horrible thing to say. Oh, yeah. Turned out to be PhDs down the road because they just had a different way of learning. It took time to get there. Yeah. 
All right. Thank you for that, gentlemen. Uh, 877-933-2484. What are the biblical reasons that would make it okay to get a divorce? That's one of those questions that probably need the whole hour on, but we can't take the whole hour. But what are your thoughts? One in scripture, it says, if the unbelieving partner leaves the relationship. Abandonment. Abandonment. That's one of them. Um, And the second one, what is the second one? I'm trying to think here. Uh, The second one has to do, uh, I can't think of it. Adultery. (laughs) Adultery. Adultery. There we go. There we go. So other people can bring up other reasons that would not honor God that aren't identified as those two, like how long do you suffer physical abuse or sexual abuse? Um, at the hands of your mate, and is that justification for it? Any divorce is like anything else, <clears throat> it, it, uh, except for the two reasons it's actually declared is sin, and God took care of that at the cross. And we end up beating ourselves up about it, having gone through it, and thinking that we're unworthy. Now, probably what the question is referring to may be they're contemplating divorce, and God can do miraculous things in the lives of our mates if we just give them an opportunity to do so based on prayer, based on, on a commitment, an unquestioned commitment. And oftentimes, it isn't what we tell them, it's how we live with them that God uses to correct their thinking and changes the dynamics of the relationship. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so often in the church, when people get in these situations, they don't talk about it. We don't know. It's all of a sudden, well, what's happened to Bill and Sue? You know, I haven't seen them in church for a couple of weeks or whatever. And that's where I think, again, as we've talked about those 59 one another passages are so critical to where we we listen to one another, we talk to one another, we share with one another. Because most of the time when I ran into couples that were having physical violence in the home, uh, the wife was getting beat up, the husband was running around on the wife all the time and flaunting it, you know, that type of thing. It's usually so far along that it would, it's almost like partying in the Red Sea for the Lord to do something. Not that he can't, but it's, it's, it's a tough one. Better to get at it early, and the earlier the better. But most people think, well, it'll, it'll be different tomorrow. That's where we need one another to talk to. I've definitely seen, even in those two cases, um, that there was abandonment. A- adultery and abandonment, that there has been uh, a transformation yes. given, and they were restored to each other. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's still possible. Uh, I just want to make sure that we say out loud the part, though, about physical abuse, that that's not okay to stay in that situation where that's you're right. unsafe. We just need to make sure we say that specifically. Um, and I, you know, we're always hoping that the people that are listening that are not experiencing that, they find a way to find themselves in a safe space, for sure. I mean, one of the first things I do to counsel somebody is you need to remove yourself from that environment. You, there's no God is not calling you to suffer physical abuse for his kingdom. Uh, in this particular, in a relationship like this, you need to separate. I don't say you need to divorce this person. That may come down the road, but you need to separate yourself from them for as long as it takes to d- be able to deal with this situation. And, and Tom, you can comment on this, but um, when you're trying to negotiate the reconciliation and the restoration of relationship, it's not that you are going to affect a change in the other person. It's that you're going to affect a change in yourself. Right. Exactly. Here's the good news of how gracious the Lord is, though, even in the midst of this, because I think we hear about, oh, they got a divorce. That's really violated the Lord's will. Well, of course, we, we violate his will a lot, you know, but he's still always reaching. My mother had two kids, and her first husband tried to murder her. Took her to Lake Erie during World War II, drowned her in the lake. I mean, he was, she was gone. It was a Tuesday. Who comes walking along the beach? An emergency room nurse said her husband... And he panics and says, my wife is drowning. She worked on my mom for 20 minutes and brought her back to life. She was gone. Well, she divorced him. My dad comes home from World War II. Two years later, meets my mom, was himself an orphan. So he takes her, marries her with her two kids. And I came along four years later. So out of the, out of the, the heartache and the, the horror of that thing, Jesus can still bring good. And that's what I try to tell people doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. It's what you do with it now with the Lord. How you pick it up, how you step forward. If you can reconcile, reconcile. Um, my mom said she could never reconcile with her husband when he tried to kill her. 
She just could not get over that and didn't know what to do. That would put a damper on the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of heartbreak in life. A lot. And simplified answers are not always helpful. Mm -hmm. So when we give simplified, because life is complex, but our God works in complexity. And he's never surprised. There, there, are no, there are no surprises in heaven. Nobody ever runs in and says, guess what? He knows exactly who we are, exactly what we're doing, and he knows exactly how to remedy it, no matter how bad it is, if we turn to him. Mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. All right, my next question is, how does one overcome a besetting personal sin? Let's first define the word besetting. Well, that's, that's a repeatable offense that just keeps repeating over and over and over. And most people that I have talked to that say they have besetting sins say they're powerless. It just overtakes them. Okay, are they repenting, knowing they're going to do it again? And if so, is that really repentance? I think at the moment they're repenting, thinking they don't want to do it again, but they have no methodology for stopping it from happening again. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they trip right back into it again. Where what I do with people that have a besetting sin like that— I will tell them, you need to join one of our small home church groups or you need to be with a group of men or a group of women to where you can be held accountable because you're not going to do this on your own. You know, it's rare that the Lord's going to make it just happen all by yourself. You need other Christians for that purpose. And I can honestly tell you, those men and women that have done that got past that sin. Those who didn't are still struggling with it today. I think the point you make about you can't do it alone is when that sin reaches in a, uh, a strong, it becomes a stronghold, then it's impossible in many cases for that person to find a way out of that without the fellowship of other believers. Freedom in Christ Ministries under Neil Anderson was all about that and helping them walk through steps to freedom. It meant to, there was a person that stood by as a prayer warrior while well, somebody was leading them through these steps to denounce these things that are having an influence on them, some of which they may have ultimately forgotten, in over Scripture. And it took a team to help that person out of that situation. So that's why fellowship is so important. That's why a community of believers is absolutely important. When we are struggling with sin, I'm running this all the time with men. They have a tendency to want to isolate themselves from the very group that could provide support, thinking yeah. they're going to be able to master it on their own, and rarely are they ever able to. Right. I said, you have to be counterintuitive about this. The very time you want to isolate yourself because of the sin that so easily besets you is the very time you need to say, no, I need to be with other men so that they can lift me up and support me and hold me accountable, and I need the support of a community of believers. All right, I think we're going to take a little break, and that gives you time to text your question over, 877-933-2484. We'd love to hear from you. We've got our fall funders are coming up starting Monday, so we're looking forward to gathering around and hearing the reports of what God is doing in your life through Faith Radio. We are so thrilled that we get so much support from you. We are listener-supported which means we get to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ loud and clear every day. And we hope that's what you hear. Uh, We uh, want to be students of God's word that rightly handles the truth and and deal with it uh, with love and grace and truth. And we thank you that you are helping us do that. You can go to MyFaithRadio.com right now, or you can even text the word GIVE to 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. Welcome to the show. It is Guy Talker, guys who talk. We love getting your questions. So thank you for that. Uh, we get so many nice comments, too. I appreciate that. Um, you encourage so many every day. You know, that is a really nice comment. It means a lot. So thank you for that. Uh, 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. Um, I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Brian D., and we are uh, always happy to uh, take on any subject that you have. Um, 
And we've had a we've had quite a different number of different topics today. Oh, we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. wonderful, though. Yeah. Um, which uh, I feel like I had a question. I don't know where it went. Um, this question about does the Bible say anything about other planets being inhabited? Brian D, I'm looking at you. Not that I know. You're of. the scientist. Yeah, uh, that's something that I I hear a lot in conversation, and it's usually connected to a desire to have um, Darwinian evolution be an explanatory narrative for how life began, because they need that to be the case that could happen randomly somewhere else. That mm-hmm. that means statistically that it could happen here. Um, but I actually um, just spent three weeks in in Cambridge listening to some of the world's best scientists um, talk about this issue, that the Darwinian evolutionary narrative is in crisis. And they've been meeting trying to explain things because uh, actually for 20 years now, there's a a paper that was published by Dr. Douglas Sachs in the journal Molecular Biology that at the time, I don't know that they understood the significance of what it was, but it was a mathematical and experimental proof that there was no way for random variations in what we call amino acids to fold into a functioning protein. There's lots of ways these uh, amino acids can fold, but for it to be effective and functioning, there's very few of those folds that are effective. And so for the the math to be done, um, he did some calculations, and it's more likely uh, that Tom here hid one atom from me in the Milky Way galaxy, and I found it on my first guess. That's more likely than a random fold of an amino acid into a protein. That's interesting. So that what, what that did is that said that the narrative for Darwinian evolution is no longer a viable approach to say that this happened by random chance. So usually the, the question about life on other planets is oriented around that because they, they need that to be true for that narrative to still hold. Um, And what we now know is that that is so remote a possibility that even with the vastness of space, we don't have either the time or the statistical opportunities for these kinds of things to have occurred by random chance. And do you think for a minute that anybody is going to be changed with that kind of information? There may be a couple, but if people are bent on wanting to set up a narrative that justifies their unbelief in God or unbelief in his activity with, with his creatures like us, that something like that, that's, that's what I call arrogant ignorance. They'll be arrogant about what they believe and refuse to be uh, informed by the truth to change their opinion. Oh, absolutely. You... The, the scientist uh, that actually did that research was kicked out of his lab and his lab and has removed his funding because they didn't like the answers that they were getting. Wow! From this Did that happen before he spoke? Or um, he was in the middle of trying to get it published when this happened. Wow! And um, if I got the story right, it's in and around that time. But there was somebody that um, was compassionate, even though they didn't share his viewpoint, helped provide him with funding and a place to continue his research. Wow! But uh, it was uh, it was earth shaking when that paper came out for the people that understood what it meant. But to your point, though, so many people are so set on what they believe, nothing that they are shown will make a difference. It's the heart that's really the problem. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu once said some time ago that he said treaties or um, anything that would would be offered up as a solution will not work. And this was from his lips. It takes a fundamental change of the heart. Of course. And that's from, from I don't know, if, I, I don't believe he's a follower of Christ, but he was absolutely right. So to your point, Brian, that the only way they're ever going to come to a realization of the truth is by a fundamental change of their heart, which is going to be responding to the spirit within them. Absolutely. Interesting conversation, gentlemen. All right, uh, Tom, P, I'm looking your direction. How w- would I distinguish the difference between f- feeling guilt Versus feeling shame after sin. Generally, guilt is you recognize your own personal failure in in a situation. Shame is usually an outgrowth of other people recognizing your guilt or your shame, your failure. And so, one is one is more internal; the other is more public. 
both of them are meant to drive you to the feet of Jesus. And that's the problem because most people carry guilt and shame. You know, when I talk to millennials today, I don't ask them about sin. They, they've thrown that word away. We st- I ask them, so tell me, how are you dealing with your shame and guilt? And I have not had one of those kids or one of those young people say, well, I don't have any of that stuff. I've had people actually say to me, well, how did you know? You know, well, because we all have it. So, yes, it's there, but I help people try to understand, regardless of the guilt, guilt is what you, you've you done. Guilt is what's, you know, come upon you. That, and are you going to bring that to Jesus? Shame is usually an accumulation of guilt over a longer period of time as other people begin to discover maybe what we've done. I think it's important to realize that God shames no one. He allows his Holy Spirit to convict you of sin, which yep. is legitimate guilt. Yep. And it's also legitimate for you as an individual to feel the shame for that that sin. But God is not the author of your shame. Right. Shame always comes from either ourselves or the enemy reminding us of our violating a standard we say we believe in. But God never shames us. All right, here's a question for my scientist, Brian D. How can, uh, how can we talk with, uh, with friends about how evolution is false and turn the conversation to the gospel? Usually the, <clears throat> the party killer is to say, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, Although you, the most satisfying. It might <laughs> feel satisfying, yeah. but it tends to be less effective. Um, you know... Asking questions has always been kind of the the magic pill to take here. You know, how do you how do you think we have had enough chances for these random occurrences to to happen? Um, you know, trying to get them to think about well, what what kind of probabilities do you think we're talking about here? Um, make a guess, right? And then if you can bring some informed information in small doses. You know, letting them sit and stew with those kinds of things for a while, that's that's usually more helpful than backing up the truck and just kind of letting them have it, even though that's what we want to do. Because <laughs> in my position, I've, I've been privileged to have all this scientific information that is nothing short of testimonies to the greatness of God. And I would love to just kind of back it up, unload the truck, and just bury them in the glory of God through what he's made. Preach it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can't because they won't take it. Yeah. Um, so asking them, you know, the, the, my favorite question is usually, well, I, I don't believe in God. I, I believe in science. Really? And usually when they're asking that, they don't know that I have a science background. So what science is it that you believe in? What specifically is it that you're believing? Because my... my, uh, my um, favorite phrase is to say that science is God's testimony about himself, not the alternative to himself. Hmm. That's a great statement. And so trying to at least engage them in beginning to doubt some of the things that they've based their faith in, if it is a scientism. Uh, Scientism being um, when science takes the place of faith, it has become a faith itself. So anyway, small doses. Yeah, it's good. Interesting, because if I can add to this, I teach a course called Getting Others to Ask You to Tell Them About Jesus. Right. And basically what you're doing is you're you're using active listening, you're using uh, understanding, temperament, and that type of thing, because most people say things like you're talking about, but can't even begin to back it up. Exactly. They don't have any evidence. And so I ask people, well, that's interesting. Can you show me where I can find that information? Where did you get that information from? And most people then begin to stumble at that point because most of them don't know where to look. That's where then you can begin to talk. And what I found is that, and I mean this honestly, uh, when I witness to people, within 10 minutes, I've had people tell me spiritual needs in their life. It's astounding because the need is there because eternity is in their heart. They just don't know what to do with it. Oh, it's a, it's a, we're, we're a society of catchphrases yep. where mm-hmm. we just repeat the the talking point not knowing if there's anything behind it whatsoever. We've become lazy in our ability to engage in the public square discourse. Oh. We've come completely unprepared to do anything but name, call, and shame and the like. I, I teach men all the time how to deal with a, a skeptic versus cynic. A skeptic, you simply answer the questions they're asking. A cynic is what we're really talking about. You simply question the answers they're giving, and that's yeah. what both of you are yeah. talking about 
is having them justify the position that they hold. They feel very uncomfortable, especially if they're using, as I like your phrase, scientism mm-hmm. as an answer rather than science. But just asking them, well, which, which science are you talking about? All of a sudden, then they're, they're caught off guard, and that's not your goal. But if you don't challenge them, right. then how are you going to be able to be, earn an opportunity to give them truth should they be open to it once they've been challenged? All right, we'll take a short break and be right back. Send your questions over. I've got some great questions we'll address when we come back. 877-933-2484. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Brian D. We'll be right back. It is my deepest desire that you take the very first step of faith by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you've got questions about what it means to begin a relationship with Jesus, text the word FAITH to 41224. More Guy Talker, guys who talk. Greg B., Tom P., Brian D. Great questions coming in. Gentlemen, here's a question. Heaven is referred to as a place, such as in the sky. Can it be thought of in the sense of a different dimension instead of physically above? Well, Paul talks about three heavens. Um, he's talking about uh, the, the heaven that's our atmosphere, and then the heaven that's beyond the atmosphere, which is space, and then heaven, which is our heavenly uh, uh, abode. So there's three spaces. Whether uh, can you can you go there? If you if you built a rocket ship, could you finally reach it? Um, I I think it may be another dimension that we're totally unaware of until we pass and God brings us into His kingdom into heaven. That sounds reasonable to me. Mm-hmm. I, engagement that I get in some of the conversations where people want to bring up the different dimensions. Um, how do I say this nicely? Um, it tends to be a, um, they're trying to invent something new in their head that sounds um, intellectual to have the conversation. But the bottom line, does it really matter? Um, we're talking about a place you can't be. How's that? Okay. Uh, so, and, if if they're wanting to engage in string theory and mathematics to get them into the discussion of other dimensions, fine. Um, but is there a direct connection that you can say definitively there's a connection between scientific dimensions as we describe them and something that we're talking about spiritually? I, it seems like a, a maybe not a productive conversation. As a pastor, I always have to focus on priorities in preaching, teaching, what we do. And uh, that's why in our church we have our purpose statement on the wall, six foot tall with Jesus up there predominantly. But the thing of it is, I think John 17, 3 should be in every church because this is eternal life, says Jesus. They know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The basic thing is it's not the place, it's the relationship. And whether that's in another dimension, I don't know, but we can have that relationship starting right now. And it goes on eternally. And that's the part I see most people missing because they're more interested in, you know, when the Bible talks about the the streets are paved with gold, well, that's asphalt. You know, that's the biggest thing in this world for people. Find gold in heaven. It's not that. It's asphalt. What's important is being with the Lord. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, how would you explain the sovereignty of God to a new believer? Wow. Well, one way to describe it would be that in the realm of God's perfect will, His sovereignty is unquestioned and can't be deterred or can't can't be impacted. In His perfect will, like for instance, the fact that you were born at the time you were born with the intellect that you received and the set of talents that you were given, the personality temperament that you received, the sense of the eternal that it says in Ecclesiastic, you're born with. That was all God's perfect will. That it was His sovereign will. Then you have his permissive will, which is a place where you can exercise your free will and can deter God's preferred direction for you by simply choosing your own to live life on a horizontal plane, devoid of any vertical relationship with your heavenly father. But God's sovereign will is unchangeable. It's something that can't be deterred. It can't be thwarted. It's God's sovereignty. And it's not mystical. It's not like, wonder what that's really, how he really feels about that. The Word of God 
and especially in the New Testament, Jesus laid it out. This is the Lord's will. This is what the Lord wants. This is what he thinks about when it comes to people or what, how he wants people to behave. So the, the big issues of life, his sovereignty is very clear. We just have to pay attention and actually walk in that. The reality is, whether we walk in it or not, his sovereignty is still there. It's whether we're going to benefit by it or not benefit by it. Yeah, it, 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 it's talking about we as finite creatures are not going to be able to comprehend the infiniteness of God. It, and his sovereignty operates in the realm of his being infinite yep. and the attributes that he has. And so there's only so far we can go with our intellect to understand that. But God is sovereign. What's happening, the, the, the battle or the war has already been determined. We know what's going to be happening. That's God's sovereign will that will not be thwarted. Like I always say, I can summarize Revelation in two words. Jesus wins. <laughs> yeah. It's the bottom line of the whole thing. Yeah. Very fun. All right, here's a question about how do I, uh, is there a way to prove to my friend that God exists? And yeah, we're getting close a, to the end here. Yeah, the prove thing is uh, kind of the sticking point, right? Um, in some sense, I find it interesting that there seems to be a natural tendency for God to not allow 100% proof. In fact, they say the only thing that you can absolutely prove is mathematics. You have a rigor and a convention that allows you to absolutely prove. But even in the sciences, when you say, hey, science says, well, it is this scientist with these conditions and these boundary conditions and these uh, sets of experimental uh, parameters that they're using, this is what we observed. Did we prove something? Maybe. We've gotten some uh, exclusionary uh, area where we can say or cannot say something. So proving is really kind of the sticking point. Can you prove to them at some point they're going to have to choose? At some point they're going to have to say, I'm going to choose to believe. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's kind of the interesting part, right? Because as we choose, what we don't want to have happen is somebody to say, well, um, you're just jumping into the dark blindly. And um, John Lennox has this great aversion to that kind of principle where he says, in, you're not jumping into the dark. You're jumping, jumping from out of the dark into the light. These principles of foundations of faith that we have have physical foundations of reasonableness to them. We have mm -hmm. historical, we have archaeological, we have written, we have personal testimonies. We have the Spirit of God showing himself through people in ways that allow us to make a, um, a understanding or informed choice to believe in God that is something that I don't think uh, that we uh, consider right away. Good word. Uh, thank you for that. That's really interesting, Brian. Brian, I appreciate that. And Tom, um, I want to ask you once again, because you're the pastor in the group, and Greg, you're a pastor too. I've been a pastor and Brian, you've never been a pastor, right? Technically, yes, no. I'm, a, I'm a pastor to people that would never go to church. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> I love it. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, we just have about a minute left, and I, I would just love for us to close in a word of prayer. And if one of you three would be willing to do that, I think that'd be lovely. Heavenly Father, the reason we ask these kinds of questions might be that somebody could say. Does it really matter? Well, it matters because we ask those questions, but we have to ask the question of why we're asking the questions, and that's because you placed eternity into each person's soul that yet, yet that we not, don't know what you've done from the beginning to the end. So that's the great mystery. We wouldn't even be concerned about these questions if you weren't the originator of them in us. And as you said in your word, no one comes to the Son except the Father draws him, that yes. you draw us. To him, that we can't even claim origination for that. The seeking out is because you've placed us in us the desire to seek you out. So we acknowledge that. And so all of those that may be struggling with those kinds of issues, you wouldn't be struggling with if God wasn't already in you in terms of this sense of the eternal. So we're just grateful for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so much, Greg B., Tom P., Brian D., great being with you all and thank you for your great answers and uh, your willingness to be here today once again 
that wraps up our show. Thank you for uh, spending time with me today, and I look forward to uh, tomorrow. Have a great night. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.